So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Stephanie Sandala. I am Programming and Outreach Specialist here at Library Link NJ. And I'm really excited to introduce Becky Boydston from Mount Laurel Library, who has alongside her Will Bower and Stacey Riker. We're going to talk about board game collections, all the fun games, how to store them, how to make space, um, how to, you know, circulate them. So all the fun things that we just have, you know, wanted to ask and never had a chance to before. All right. So you can hear me now? Yes, okay. you're all set. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Becky Boydston. I'm the director here at the Mount Laurel Library, and I have uh, Will Bohr, who's one of our adult services librarians, and uh, Stacy Riker McNulty, McNulty yes, <laughs> um, who uh, is our assistant circulation supervisor. Um, so I'm just going to give um, a brief overview of how we started our board game collection. Will and Stacy weren't here when we first started. Um, the collection back in 2018. Um, at that time, we were also starting, we were getting into the Library of Things um, idea. It's, we're starting a cake pen collection, and one of our librarians here at the time was um, liked to play board games and suggested that we start a, um, a small board game collection. Uh, we decided to focus on games that use more um, strategy rather than just uh, chance. So say Monopoly is not one of the games um, that we would have in our collection. And we were also looking at games that were more cooperative, that you could um, play as a team, uh, that weren't necessarily um, uh, where you were competing against each other. Uh, so like um, Sellers of Catan or Carcassonne or uh, uh, one for little kids was Hoot Owl Hoot. Um, and we also tried to have games for a, a range of ages, you know, for um, younger kids and uh, adults, but, you know, especially family-oriented games. Um, we started with about 15 games um, in 2018, and we added 10 more in the next year, and we're now up to about uh, 49 games. Yep. Is that right? And we purchased most of our games from Amazon, and the initial amount we spent um, on those 15 games was $430. And for us, the average cost is about $28. Um, so a few games are more expensive, but uh, uh, but they're right around that $28 mark. Um, so Will's going to talk to you a little bit more about um, our how we do our um, deciding what games to purchase and what games have been popular. And Stacy will talk to you about um, what it's like to circulate them and how we uh, deal with any issues that come up. Um, I also, I'm the director now, but I started out as a cataloger. So I also do the cataloging for the, the games that we have. And I will just say it's, um, for the most part, you can find a record for um, in OCLC for most of these games. So cataloging them is, is not an issue uh, for us. I, I, don't know of any game that I've had to, you know, create a, a record completely from scratch. Um, the only thing is just checking, you know, the contents note to make sure that um, that it matches with what we actually have. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Will next, and um, I'm gonna share I'm gonna share his um, screen here. Um, to start, there's a few reasons why board game collections are a great one to include, or, you know, a great collection to include among your collections. Uh, over 40% of our board games circulate at least once every two months, and over 75% of them circulate at least once every three months, which I think is just a fantastic stat for any collection. Um, another fun fact I noted is that Circulation of pan, um, the board game pandemic. I don't know if anyone's ever played it. That did actually not drop during the pandemic. In fact, its best circulating year was 2021. So sometimes you just can be really surprised by what works and what mm -hmm. doesn't. So when you're looking to expand your collection, there's a number of factors which are things you generally want to consider. Uh, recommended age is a good one. You want to have board games for a very wide range of ages. 
Uh, I've generally found that games that um, games that work well for eight to eleven year olds are often some of your best circulating ones. Although sort of games that work well for eight to eleven year olds, but that parents will have fun playing with them, like the Trekking games, are some of the best performing within that category. Um, other factors to consider are things like how many players does it take, right? Like some games, you know, it work with two players, but they're really only good if you have four or six. Um, other games, you know, are really well designed for two players and sort of don't work so well if you have more, you want to have a wide variety. There, um, the length of time that it takes to play a game is another consideration there, right? People will want games where they can sit down and they can, you know, play a game really quickly in 15 minutes. But anyway, yeah, so um, some other factors to consider when building it are the complexity of the game. Um, some games, you know, you can learn really quickly and you can just get going. Other games will take like an hour to learn, an hour to set up. And some people really like that and some people do not. So you want a wide variety there. Um, the genre of the game, genre is sort of a strange thing to consider with board games. We usually think of it with books. But, you know, if you look into board games for a while, you will find that these exist, things like cooperative versus competitive games, things like um, deck building games, um, social deduction. You will run across these categories as you look into it and get used to it. Um, another one is name recognition and popularity. Some games are just very well known and others will have um, popular names attached to them. Like there's a whole number of Disney games out there and Disney games often do well. In fact, our third best performing game is a game called Codenames Disney. Um, and another factor you want to consider is just the uniqueness of the game. You know, it can be worth having a game in your collection that might not do as well as other games if it offers players something really different from any other game at all. Like our worst performing game, and even our worst performing game does fairly well, is a game called Nyctophobia, which is a game where all but one player is all like blindfolded as they play it, which is just something that's really different from just about anything else out there. And, you know, that has its own value. I jumped ahead. Okay. All right. So we now have our slideshow, finally a little bit late, but better late than never. So where I was going to start is um, when the games come in, I sort of, I make these sheets that we use for check-in and Stacy will talk more about the CERC procedures in a bit, but um, this is just, they don't have to look super pretty because these are internal documents, but these are just really helpful with um, whoever you have counting all the pieces to make sure they all come in when they, you know, when they come back in. It's just useful to have things laid out, have it very clear what's, what the parts of the games are and how much of each there is. And I, I just sort of put these together in Publisher. Um, I have another example here from Ticket to Ride Europe um, where I took part of the instruction booklet and used it to help make it because sometimes the, you know, the instruction booklets are just going to display it better than you will by spreading them all out. For example, this one tells you exactly, you know, how many of each colored train card you have. Um, and then another thing about circulating games is we keep them behind a counter. You know, we don't just have them out there because we don't want them to sort of disappear. And also, well, you know, they're bulky and odd objects. So in order to help people look through the games and decide what they want, we do two things. One is um, we create a binder full of example sheets like these that you have up. Um, and we just generally sort of include a picture of the game, um, some key information like the number of players, an age recommendation, an approximate playing time, and then a description from the publisher or from somewhere like Board Game Geek. And these are fairly simple to make, but they help people sort of look through and make a choice of what they want. Because it can be hard to tell exactly what a game is or is about just from looking at the side of the box. Another thing we do is we have a, um, a handout that we keep around the library that people can just sort of look through quickly to sense, you know, to see all the games that we have. And if people recognize something, they'll often come up and ask about it. Okay, so I've already gone through these, but again, these are some really good reasons to keep a board game collection. <laughs> um, and again, I was just going over this, factors to consider when choosing new games. Um, and so I've talked about most of these already. The final one to think of is sort of just look over your current collection, look at what's missing, what's popular, right? If something's popular, it can be worth getting more games like that. If something is just entirely missing, right? Like let's say you look at your collection, you go, oh, I don't have anything that's really good for just two players, or there's just, there's no social deduction games or um, anything like that, then it can be worth, you know, trying to find some of these. 
So when you're trying to find new games, um, it's sort of like a different world entirely. You know, and sometimes it's hard to just figure out what is even out there. Um, one good place to look is, you know, if you have a game that's doing well, often other games from the same publisher will do well, and most games will come with ads from that same publisher, or you can just look them up and find more there. Um, most areas have local board game stores that you can go to and look around, and the staff there will often be very helpful and have recommendations on what's been doing well lately, et cetera. Um, your coworkers, you know, you might be surprised who among your coworkers is into board games and who plays board games and just who has some recommendations that you might not have heard of. You know, I've picked up a couple of some of the better performing games in our collection that way. And then finally, BoardGameGeek.com. If you just don't know where else to look, you can just, this website is just a fantastic repository. Just everything, board game, they have pretty much every board game in the world listed. And even if you already have ideas, you can go there to sort of get a good sense of what the game is about, how people feel about it, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I have a few final tips. One is that you don't need to focus on new board games. You know, with most collections, things are most popular when they first come out, and then, you know, circulation drops off often fairly rapidly when things get to a year or two old. But with board games, this just doesn't really happen. Um, most of our games, you know, it, it varies, but it's very rare that their first year is their best year. Um, you know, they, they sort of just they go up and down over time. So um, just because a game like has just come out and is generating a lot of buzz, you know, sometimes the board game community gets really excited about a game, but it turns out to be really niche only for like, you know, really hardcore board game players and your sort of average library patron isn't going to have as much interest in. And, you know, there is some space for some of those games because you want games for like someone who wants to play every board game and gets really into them will go through. But I think games that have a bit more casual appeal are things that you want to focus on a bit more. And one last thing. So um, sometimes when looking at new games, you know, if, if you look at a series and it's doing really well, you might consider getting more of that series. And I found that um, this can actually be a really big hit, but it can also just sort of split circulation. And the difference here seems to come down to either how similar the mechanics are or if there's some other critical factor that's different. So I found that with the Trekking series, um, that was a series that was doing well. So I ordered more of it. And every game in that series continues to be you know, very highly performing. And I think that series has like a very common aesthetic to all the games, but each one plays a little differently. So they don't sort of seem to like um, cannibalize each other's circulation. And they, you know, they all do well. And then Ticket to Ride First Journey is another one like that. You know, it's very similar to the popular game, Ticket to Ride, also known as the train game, but it's just aimed at a younger demographic and those have done well. Um, I also did this with Azul and Ticket to Ride Europe and I found that that kind of split the circulation of the games, which doesn't necessarily mean you don't want to get them if this is doing really, really well. You know, it might be something where it's popular enough that it's worth it, but that's something you sort of have to look at in your own collection and make your own decision there. And as a final sheet, I have a couple of recommended games that do, you know, some of the top performing games in our co collection that I would recommend that if you're starting a collection from scratch, these are things you might want to look at. Um, Catan, Catan just, we have two copies of it, it does better than anything else. Uh, Exploding Kittens, the Trekking series, as I mentioned earlier, the Ticket to Ride series, the Sneaky Snacky Squirrel Game, Yeti and My Spaghetti, which if you haven't heard of it, you've got to look that one up, it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, Cards Against Humanity, although we carry the family edition instead of the regular one. And um, you have to do the same thing with Exploding Kittens, make sure you get the safer work edition. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, Cards Against Humanity, um, Codenames Disney, and in fact, anything Disney, although Codenames Disney is the one that does the best, and Wingspan. And that's the end of my bit. Okay, so take it away, Stacey. Okay, so as far as circulation, fortunately, Will does make up these lovely handouts that we have to consult with in terms of what the parts and pieces are. Um, when anything is, is returned to us, we don't check it in right away. We tell our customers that we're going to check it before we will check it in. So they understand they're not going to see it come off of their account right away. And then we'll either have a staff person check it in um, or go through the process to make sure that everything is there. Or sometimes it's something we'll have our volunteers do, which is great because we don't always have enough activities for our volunteers to work on. Um, so that's a good thing. If, if we have a clear enough sheet of, you know, these pieces need to be here, then 
most of our volunteers are capable of going through and doing that. So that might be something that's helpful in another way that you're not thinking of when you consider adding a board game collection. Um, so there are some of these games that are really unwieldy and uh, nobody wants to count them, but they do circulate a lot. It is an exciting thing for people to have. So it, you know, it doesn't actually take as long as people are afraid it's going to take. You just go through the process. You have this handout right in front of you and you just say, okay, do I have these pieces? Eventually you're not going to have all the pieces. <laughs> it's just going to happen. It's an inevitability. Um, so when that happens, the first thing we do is we'll just call the people and we'll ask them, do you still have this piece that's missing from the game? And a lot of the time, if it's a, you know, if, if it's something they returned recently, they can still find it and they'll just return it to us and then not a big deal. Um, if they aren't able to find it, if it's a little tiny piece and they didn't even play the game and they're not sure that they ever got the piece to begin with, it can be more of a production for us to try to resolve it. So there's two things that we typically will do to try to resolve the issue. Um, a lot of the games will have multiple pieces and what's missing is something that we have another copy of. So in that case, often we can either 3D print or some other way DIY make up a new version of the piece that's missing. Um, that doesn't take too long. It's not expensive for us. So we just will do that if that's an option. Sometimes the pieces are unique and then we're in a little bit more trouble um, because we don't have a copy. We only have one copy of every game in our collection. If you're a library with multiple branches, I guess it'd be more likely that you'd have multiple copies and then that would make it easier for copying pieces when they do go missing. But if you're just starting off small, um, you might run into it where you're missing a piece that you don't have anything that you can copy from. So in that case, we've usually reached out to the manufacturers and they've been very good about getting us new pieces when we need them. Um, they usually have a comment form or submit form on their website so you can say exactly what's missing and they'll look into it. They usually get back to us pretty quickly, often don't charge us anything to replace one small piece here or there. Um, so that's a really good solution. That's worked out well. Um, and then in, in that case, we usually do charge the customer a $5 processing fee if we have to expend any money or time in, an ex in a broad way trying to replace the, the piece. Usually we will waive that the first time that it's happened just so that they're aware. And so it's not a, we don't want it to, be, it to be like a deterrent to using the collection, but we do want them to understand that there are penalties if they're not being careful with the equipment that's involved. Um, for the most part, it's, it's really, it's not been an issue, but you will come across that from time to time. So once you found that all the pieces are there, then you can check it in. We do have a separate like status that we keep games in. It's like a verification status that we change it to so that we can still see who's the last person who had it out so that we can contact them or charge their account for that $5 processing fee if need be. Um, but beyond that, that's, uh, that's really the main process that we have to go through in terms of circulation. The other thing, uh, like we mentioned, we don't keep the board games out on the shelves for people to browse. What we do instead is we have, just like our folder that we have of the game pieces, we have the folder that Will mentioned with the descriptions of the game. So we'll share that with customers. There's also the flyer that's out front. Um, and then sometimes we'll have a display of a few games that we keep out on the shelf. But we actually take all the pieces out of the game box so that we don't have customers playing the game in the library because that has been a problem before. Um, at least we know that we can probably find the piece at some point because it didn't go anywhere, but we don't know who's using it. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to track. Um, but if we at least have the board, big board game boxes out, people can see that they're there and get a sense that this is maybe something they should look into and try out. <clears throat> And I think it's not that we're really worried that they would steal the game, no. but that they would open the box and then everything falls going everywhere and not getting back in the box. So, so I think that's the highlights of um, what's involved in this. So I think you know we would be ready for any questions that anybody has. Yeah, thank you all. That was great. Um, and Stacey, you answered some of my questions about the replacement parts and missing pieces. So that was helpful. I do see a great question from Kayla in the chat of how long is your checkout time for the games? Do you charge late fees aside from a $5 replacement fee if necessary? 
Um, so okay. Stacey, that might be a good question for you. Yeah, we don't charge late fees in general anymore. The only thing we charge late fees on at this point are amusement passes, but anything else in the collection, we don't charge any overdue fees daily or anything like that. So we do not charge any overdue fees on the board games at all. Um, the regular lending period is one week. Um, they cannot be renewed um, if there's requests on them or anything like that, but otherwise they can be renewed one time. So that they can get it for two weeks total if they need to. Otherwise, they can bring it back, check it in, and then we can check it back out to them if they're that desperate to play it once again. But that is a little bit more complicated than usually we will do that with regular items in our collection. But with the board games, we do have to make sure that all, all the pieces are there. If they're going to be taken out themselves, it's still the same person who's responsible for it. So it hasn't really come up too much, but it might be a question of, you know, do we need to go through and count every piece for this one so you can take it right back out again? But I think the one week mm -hmm. loan period yeah. seems to work for most people. So. <clears throat> Great. That was my question too, about the lending period. So thank you for answering that. So does anyone else have any questions? Um, you're also welcome to unmute yourself, put anything in the chat. Um, yeah, any questions you may have. So, yeah, Will, your presentation was great too about the popular games. So that was going to be my question of like which games are really popular. Like I like Wingspan too. So I was just taking notes of like which games circulate well and you know which ones are popular. So that was really helpful. And does anyone else have any questions for yeah, either Becky, Will, or Stacy? Or questions about lending board games in general? Are other people here lending board games? That was me my next question also. If anyone else mm -hmm. is circulating board games, and if so, do you have similar policies? Like what's your lending period? Do you have late fees? Like which games are popular? at your library. Um, so yeah, all of the questions that I have personally. Yeah, Kayla, are you lending board games right now at Pensacan? Not yet, okay. Um, I'll just, and I'll just mention something else that we've started doing recently, sort of board game adjacent. Um, is they're not officially in our collection, but we've started a jigsaw puzzle swap. Um, so we just have, we got some jigsaw puzzles donated to us and we just have them out on display and people can just bring one, take one. Um, so, but we don't do any kind of, you know, they don't get checked out on your library card at all. We don't kind of, when donations come in, we'll kind of look the puzzles over to see if they seem to be in good condition. Um, but um, it's a very hands-off uh, uh, collection for us. But that has been, we started that, um, I think in the early summer or spring, and that's been pretty popular. And I think when the cold weather gets here, that that will be even more popular. I, I think I've I've heard of some libraries that actually add them have a collection and check them out, but um, we all agreed that we didn't want to uh, get involved in counting pieces for a thousand piece puzzle. So, um, and a lot of our puzzles go from um, a lot are five hundred or a thousand pieces. There are a few that are bigger and a few that are smaller than that, but that's about the average size for that. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing about that too. Have you found that the puzzles are as popular as the board game so far, or is it like kind of comparable, or is one more popular than the other? Um, I mean, it's hard to say since we don't check them out. But I think just um, just seeing that you know, if you go look at what's there, that it changes, you know, from uh, week to week. So it's not always the same puzzles sitting there, and I think. When we posted it on Facebook, we got a it's, fairly good reaction yeah, it's been from one people. Of the better, they really thought that it was a good idea. Facebook so um, I think that would have, if we'd had that during the pandemic, that would have been really popular, you know, when everyone uh, was, uh, you know, staying at home for a while. Um, and I, I think, you know, when we get into cooler weather, we'll see if um, 
around the holidays, you know, the jigsaw puzzle is always good for a family gathering to work on as a group. And um, we also did, we recently did a jigsaw puzzle competition, but I was not, I was, that was last week. I was on vacation, so I don't know how that turned out. It went really well, yeah. I yeah. didn't know personally, but Olympia said it did great. She had 21 people yeah. who showed up for it. Um, we bought it, so we bought it, like four or five copies of the same puzzle, and then people played in teams and to compete to see who could finish it first. So yeah. It was not a thousand piece puzzle. It was only 500. 500. So. Although she said she might do a thousand next time because some people finished it really quickly, and um, they're going to do it again in October. Okay. So... Yes, yeah, if you're looking for things to do with jigsaw puzzles, that's a great yes. idea. Um, and and we have occasionally hosted um, board game nights here at the library. I don't know. I yeah, know it's, it's been, been a while, while since we've done um, that. They had but... started to peter out in popularity. Yeah. Um, might be something to try again. There's a couple of board game libraries in the area, which is sort of a little business someone sets up where like they have a bunch of board games on their shelves and people can pay to rent a table okay. and then play one of those games so that might be soaking up people's interest in coming to a place mm -hmm. to play a board game i i'm not sure but um that is something that's been hopping up um, i guess another thing i could talk about is what to do when you get people um asking about making donations to oh, right because that can happen um it hasn't happened too much here although i heard from the director of the library so we get the after they started theirs, they got a lot of people trying to donate like old sets of Monopoly and stuff, which you just, you don't want those. Um, and, you know, you will get better suggestions sometimes. Um, but what I found is that most people, if they're suggesting donations, they're assuming that money is the sort of limiting factor. And usually if you just explain that shelf space is kind of the limiting factor, most people just accept that at that point. Um, Yeah, and you definitely never want to accept anything that's very used, but something that's been used once or twice could possibly be worth looking at. We've actually picked up a couple that way. Yeah, but you, know, you want to make sure you know it's in good condition and everything is there, and that and it does fit in with the kinds of games that we would be um, purchasing otherwise. So. Yeah, that's really helpful. I was going to ask about donations, especially too, um, since I was just really curious about that. Yeah, especially the old sets of Monopoly, which yeah. I can imagine you're getting a lot of requests about. Yeah, you know, but none of like Monopoly or Life or um, Clue, Clue, um, Scrabble, Scrabble. Well, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Shoots and Ladders, Candyland, you know that kind of thing. So. So, yeah, and again, probably games that people may not have, um, may not be familiar with. Um, I don't know if, if any people, if they try the game and they like it a lot, that they would then just go out and then buy their own copy if they think they're going to be playing it um, regularly, but it gives you a chance to try it out before you commit to purchasing your own, so. so. No, I completely agree. I was going to ask also, like, how do you promote your board game collection? Um, well, I think we meant that we do have a few um, empty boxes out on a, a display uh, space near the front of the library. And we do have a, a flyer with a list of the games available on there. And then the usual... You know, we'll post it on Facebook sometimes, but I think it's mostly word of mouth that it spreads by. And also when we hand out like library cards, when someone registers for a library card, we tell them, you know, just so that you're aware, we also lend out cake pans, board games, video games, museum passes, all the things that they may not be expecting. That's one of the things that we tell them right off the bat. Awesome, so, yeah. That's so, great. So they are hearing about it So since they do, you know, um, circulate pretty well, so. Yeah. I don't know if people expect to find them at the library, but once word gets out, like people want these, so mm -hmm. word spreads. Yeah. So, okay. I also have another question. I know I thought sure. I have so many yeah. questions. Yeah, do you get requests for specific board games? 
Um, sometimes it's a lot rarer than getting requests for books or whatnot, but it has happened. I think, um, what was it? I think trekking through history we picked up because someone had requested it and that turned out to be a really good. Um, we sort of handle it. The same. Well, I guess we don't handle it the same way we would any request, but, um, because we're likely to get a book request, but yeah, we just pass those along. Those just get passed along to me and, um, I'll get back to the. Patronas, they're not nearly as common as other sorts of requests, but they do come in occasionally. But in that case, you know, we already had one of the trekking games and and it, it yeah. in that so it was just another one in the series that we were adding, and it did fit in with you know the kinds of games that we were um you know trying to have in our collection. So yeah, there have been requests that we've said no to. Um yeah, just... what was it? uh ba I don't remember. battleship or mm -hmm. or no it was one of those games that's sort of like um it wasn't exactly charades but it was like some sort of like new variant of charades mm -hmm. you know that sort of genre uh-huh um i don't remember the exact title but there was a game like that that was requested that um i think it like had to play in it or something and i just it probably was like one of the ones where you have like papers you have to like write down things all you know kind of like yeah, it was, yeah, it like, would have like, like gotten where, used. where it starts yeah it starts to get used um, a little and i just didn't think it fit the sort of games that we had so what else Stephanie? <laughs> yes oh okay catherine has a great question do you store the games in their original boxes that's a really good question which i should have thought of that um, so yeah, how do you store the games? Are they in their original box when you yes. lend them out? Yeah, um, I think most of the boxes are pretty sturdy yeah. that they come in. Are well, okay, <laughs> for the most part they are. We had a Yeti in my spaghetti, like a whole kind of debacle that came came up eventually over it because you know that's that's for very young children, so the box is naturally going to get beat up anyway. And we had kept like taping it up and taping it up and putting rubber bands around it but eventually it would be coming back and like the noodles would start to fall out. So then we had to put the noodles in, in like plastic bags. And eventually somebody lost some major piece of, I think they lost the Yeti that goes in the spaghetti. So they knew that they had lost it. And rather than letting us know about it, they just went ahead and bought their own copy of it. So then we had to take their copy <laughs> and kind of reassemble everything using that. But because our box was in such bad shape, we eventually did switch over to using the uh, original, the new box that they had purchased us, which was a another problem because it had like the Yeti jumping out of the box. It was like, there was a cut out in the box and the little Yeti figure was sticking out of it. So we had to take the old drawing of the Yeti off the other box and like Frankenstein it together, put it on and cover up the hole that had been created. Um, and the other thing that we had to do with all the boxes that we get, um, it was, we do put a label on the back that it lists all the parts and pieces on there as well, which is helpful for them, but is not does not replace our, our folder with all of our images and everything like that. But at least they have something to go off of. We do ask them to check you know, that they've returned all the pieces using that, but that doesn't always happen, but it, it's helpful to have it there. And then we also recently put a label on all the boxes explaining our procedure in terms of, you know, we are going to check to make sure that all the pieces are there before we check it in. So don't be surprised if you still see the item on your account for a little while. And also if they do not return all the pieces, they can be charged up to $5 for a lost processing fee. Um, just because sometimes people were very surprised that there was, a consequence to losing the pieces, but if if even one piece is not there in certain games, they're not playable at all. So having that little warning is kind of a safety precaution for us so they can be aware of what they're getting themselves into by checking it out. But yes, for the most part, the, bo the boxes are sturdy enough yes. to, to continue to circulate at the level that they do. Except for Yeti and my spaghetti. Um, <laughs> and so that some of the games um, do come with, um, a lot of little plastic bags to store all the pieces in. Um, if they don't come with that, we get some of the bags ourselves and that's helpful to um, uh, put those pieces in the bags with a label, like that this should have 25 blue pieces in it or you know whatever the specific we also, part, part is. I should mention this earlier, we also put a sticker on the back of the box that mentions all the pieces yeah. so that people can check those over before 
they bring them back. Yeah. A lot of the boxes, a lot of the games do have their own list of um, what's included in the box already. Um, but we just for consistency for staff and for the um, people borrowing the games, we make our own list of all the uh, pieces that are in there. So there's you, there's one spot where you can look to see what what should be in there. Um, and I, I think I so there's a question in the chat about signing. We don't make anybody. We don't make them sign any kind of agreement. I think the only thing we do that on is uh, museum passes when they borrow one of those, which that doesn't even, so many passes now are, um, we can just do the printable passes. And so they know, don't even have to borrow anything from us. Um, but the ones where people are still actually borrowing a pass, we do make them sign something because I think Stacy mentioned that is the one thing that we're still charging uh, an overdue fine for um, 20, $25. $25 yeah, yeah. if it's um, late, um, we're still doing that. Is there another question there? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Do you require borrowers to be a certain age to check out a board game? Um, do kids need an adult to check out an adult board game? That's a good question too. No, we don't have any um, age requirements on the board games. Um, I, again, I think the only thing we have in our collection that uh, we don't let um, uh, kids borrow are the museum passes. Yeah, I mean, that's just a greater expense if something, if we lose the museum pass, whereas if they lose a, a part or a piece from the board game, it's usually a minimal to no cost to replace the piece that we end up finding. Um, yeah. And even, even if the, you know, the whole game doesn't come back, you know, I said, you know, the average cost is $28. So it's not nearly, um, you know, a lot of books are getting to be, yeah. you know, in that price range these days or, uh, or you know, video games, that sort of thing. Oh so, yeah. So, um, I so it would feel like a deterrent if we had those kind of things, like we don't want it to be too much for the customer to even feel like it's worth checking out. I think we just want it to be a little more user friendly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and another question. I know you mentioned that you store um, the books behind a circulation desk. Do you just have like is it like a room? Like, how is your storage set up? I guess for people who have like really small space, like how do you fit the board games? I just have so many questions about like all yeah. the storage and, well, and making I, it work. I guess it's kind of hard. So we have a, a very large circulation desk. And then right behind that, there is a, there's an office, but the wall there behind the circulation desk has some shelves on it. Some, just some open shelving. And so that's, so they're on the shelves there. Um, so they are kind of, I mean, if you walk up to the desk, you can see them back there. So, you know, it's not really great for browsing, but that's, you know, they, they can see them back there. Um, but that's, we don't, there's not a lot of shelf space there. So that's kind of, are we kind of full right now? First, close to close. To we reorganized it a little bit. So we have enough room that we could potentially add like maybe five more games. Yeah. Um, recently, we like moved the box that we had been keeping there. It, it is like a balancing act of yeah. using that shelf space. So we also store our video games on the same shelving unit um, because we keep all of the cartridges and, and discs and everything for the video games behind the counter. And then we have the cases for the video games out front for people to browse. And then they bring up the video game. And we check out the actual disc to them at that point. But all those are kept in little, little, like little tiny, like file cabinets on top of the board game shelves. So I have seen other libraries keep their board games out on their shelves. And the libraries that I've seen do that, they generally keep them in. Um, I don't know if you've seen like those plastic bags that some libraries used to build kids, 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 not kids, kids out of, you know, and they sort of snap together at the top and the plastic is clear. Um, they generally put them inside those when they do it, which I guess is a way to keep people mm -hmm. from just sort of opening them up mm -hmm. out there. So if you don't have space around your circulation desk, that might be another option that you could consider. Yeah, that was super helpful. So thank you for that too. Yeah, our video games, 
we um, we don't do we don't do any kind of security really, and um, even our um, DVDs and CDs we're getting away from using any security cases on them. But and I don't know if it would be as bad as if it, as it had been. But video games were we couldn't figure out any way to keep them from walking out the door except for keeping the the disc or cartridge behind the desk. So. So that is um, one of the few things that we do that with. So, so. Huh. anything else to think of or any other questions? Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in a the chat or unmute. I think based on the chat I've seen so far, most people don't have board game collections just yet, but are considering it. But a lot of people have video game collections. so. I wanted to have like a combination of video games and board games. So I yeah. think it'd be a really cool idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice mix, you know, between the, uh, you know, uh, electronic and uh, old, old style games. So. Yes, definitely. Wait, Faith and Barbara, not to put you on a spot. Do you guys have board game collections? Um, at your libraries, I wasn't sure. Um, I was just kind of curious too. I like that you have some for program space, but not for lending. Is that for like adult programs or children's or both? Okay, that makes sense. Um, teen and tween game nights and family game nights, which is a really fun program idea. Yeah, I know, Will, you had mentioned something similar before too, I think, about oh, like game nights. Yeah. We had some game afternoons for a while, a while ago. Um, the attendance of those have petered out for a bit, so we haven't held one in a while. Um, we've done some other things. We used to have a chess club. We actually have a Scrabble club I yeah. think, starting up soon. Um, it's a little adjacent, but we did Life Size Candyland the other month, <laughs> which was quite the production. Yes, um, it was one of our summer reading activities. So. Yeah, which is funny because we, you know, we don't actually keep Candyland in the collection, <laughs> but. Um, that's a board game related activity you can do as well. Yeah, I will. I think we're going to do it. it. It's not something that it, it was a very big production to get that up and running. It was very, it went over really well. But I think once we've made all the uh, props and decorations, we'll probably do it again sometime. But it's not something that you would do every too month. Often. No, not too often. Yeah, I think we had around 250 people for it. Yeah, 250. Like which is, I think it was over, a, a, was it, it was on a Friday. It was a Friday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like afternoon into evening. So it was over a several hour period. So people would play and um, we'd let so many people through at a time. And... Yeah, yeah, we would, um, the way it was designed was we would give people um, pins, not, not pins, um, they're like little, Not stickers. Yeah, they're like little pins, little button pins. Yeah, buttons. We give people buttons that were one of five different candies. And then I was spinning a wheel and I would go through the things one at a time. I would say, you know, if you were this color, you know, or if you're, if you're this pin, if your gumdrops go to purple or whatever came up. Um, if you're lollipops, you can go to red. Uh, there was a double red square as well. So that people could have that double effect. Um, that was how it worked. We had five different buttons, although the one major piece of feedback we had was if we did it again, we would do three buttons instead just to make it move a bit faster um because even if people come in groups they don't sort of mind doubling up on buttons even if they do like to compete so um that is a general design if anyone has any questions about the details of that we can you know if stephanie can pass a message on and we can explain it all that sounds like a fun program idea i love candyland <laughs> and like an adult life-size Candyland sounds like incredible. Uh -huh. So I would definitely attend that. Yeah. Yeah, I like Faith putting the comments. It sounds like so much fun. It really does. And Will, you think you're playing your hype, your headline again in the future of the Candyland um, um, program? I think it's being looked at for a Saturday. Um, okay. I, I don't think anything's set in stone yet, but. Okay. Yeah. being considered for a, a Saturday in the future. Yes, keep me posted. Okay. I'm very invested. 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know if you want to sign up for it. So. <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Sorry, I'm like hijacking the conversation. Um, but feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, yeah, we'd just be happy to have any ideas, suggestions, questions, um, thoughts, all of the above. No, I agree, John. This was really great, too. This was so helpful. Yeah, I think, Stacey, your tip about reaching out to manufacturers about missing pieces is something I hadn't considered. So I'm really glad that you highlighted that because that is always my question. I mean, yeah. I just lose pieces on my own. Um, so I'm always worried about just them just going missing, you know, for other games as well. So that's a really good um, tip of yeah, advice. They're, they're really good about that because, you know, it makes them look good as a company. So then they know that they can get a repeat customer. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not hard for them because they, you know, have so many copies of it. They just ship it right out to you and then you can go on continuing to enjoy your game. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. I think. Yeah. And that's what they would do for, you know, they were doing it for individuals. It's not just something that they do for libraries. So. Right. Because pieces do get lost. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I have one last question. Do you ever like sure. read your collection of board games or if something isn't like really as popular as much? So anymore to date it has never been weeded um if we want to you know as we mentioned earlier we are a bit low on space so it might be something that has to happen in the future um but it it has not happened it has not happened yet um again even our worst performing board game circulates almost twice a year so i'm a little hesitant to do it at all but um yeah i guess we'll have to see in the future yeah, I, I mean, there hasn't been any game that's been a complete dud, um, but yeah, I guess, you know, like you said, if if we did want to make more space, that maybe some of the games that are lower on the lower end of circulating, but that's not that, even that, what game is that? Uh, Nyctophobia is the worst performance oh, okay. game, which circulated um, five times in three years, and yeah. Yeah. And that's probably just one that people aren't probably aren't that familiar with, so they don't know. Right. Yeah. I mean, the games that are sort of the worst performing are games that there's either something very strange about that. Like I mentioned, Nyctophobia is the game where everybody but one player is blindfolded. Some of the other ones that are low performing are Agricola and Scythe, which are sort of very complicated games. Uh, I think they're about Agricola is like about farming in the 17th century and it has some very complicated rules and but there is a demographic that that you know that that sort of game supports and you know we do want to provide games for that demographic as well even if we're going to have you know less of those than the ones that are flying off the shelves we you know we started the game uh, the collection um in 2018 um it's not you know it's not that old so it hasn't needed meeting yeah. Yes. And I see in the comments, Faith is interested in Candyland as well, if you do yes. that again. So you have a captive audience here. <laughs> right. Well, if they ever run it, we'll invite you all. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, but this was great. Um, so yeah, thank you, Becky, Stacy, and Will for answering all of our questions, giving us all the insight for the presentation too, which is super helpful. I can share with everyone afterwards. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in touch and we're happy to help. Yes, and thank you all for being here too. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Yep, thank you.